The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu or speaking with the student worker after the program. After the presentation, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you have difficulty hearing during the program, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers who will assist you. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Associate Director Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Kristen. Good afternoon and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and today's program with our 2017 Dole Leadership Prize recipient, retired U.S. Senator Tom Harkin. Today's interview will be conducted by the director of the Dole Institute, Bill Lacey. We are very pleased to be joined today by several special guests, including KU Chancellor Douglas Gerard and Marty Martin, president of Drake University. Would you both please stand? Drake is home to the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement. Thank you to Joseph Jones, the director of the Harkin Institute, and Marcia Turnus, former director and chair of their National Advisory Council, for being here today. Finally, would all of the Drake University and Harkin Institute board members, staff, students and supporters visiting from Iowa today. Would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you very much and we're delighted that you could join us today. United States Senator Tom Harkin represented Iowa in the U.S. Congress for over four decades, including 30 years as a United States Senator. As a young senator, he was tapped to craft the landmark legislation that would become the Americans with Disability Act, or as we know, ADA. He was a champion of that legislation, sponsoring it in the Senate through its passage in 1990 and introducing later legislation to preserve its protections from discrimination. Hailing from Cumming, Iowa, his long career focused on issues related to health care access and nutrition, farm policy, and labor issues. We are pleased to honor him today with the 2017 Doe Leadership Prize for his work on the Americans with Disability Act and for his efforts to advance bipartisanship and civil discourse. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please give Senator Tom Hawkin a recognition? And if you are a Jayhawk, give him a very warm Jayhawk thank welcome. Just in case I forgot, because I, I don't remember, today's interview will be conducted by the director of the Dole Institute, Bill Lacey. Bill Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming out today. We really appreciate it. Uh, Senator, it's great to have you here at the Dole Institute. It's great to be here. And thank you for all the help you've given uh, Joseph and Marsh and everybody else at the Harkin Institute up in Drake. Uh, it's been great to have them come and visit and see how we do things. And they get to see firsthand how we do today. So uh, hopefully it's been helpful to them. But let's, oh, yeah. let's get to our program, Senator. Start a little bit by telling us about your upbringing and education. Well, not a heck of a lot to tell. Um, uh, as Barbara said, I was born in a small town of Cumming. Uh, Cumming so small it would about fit in this room, I think. <laughs> no, that's, that's an exaggeration. Not much, though. Um, you know, I was like, 
coming as a small town, it had 150 people there all the time I was growing up. There's two streets in coming, okay? One, it goes up, makes a U, and comes back. Only in small town America, I don't know about Kansas, but at least in Iowa, only in small town Iowa could you live in a town with two streets, and the street on which you live is North 43rd Street. <laughs> <laughs> and no one can explain it. <laughs> so uh, I grew up in that small town. Um, went, I went to a uh, kind of a two-room schoolhouse. Uh, actually, it was three. We had, but in the in the big school, we had the third, fourth, and fifth grades in one room, and the sixth, seventh, and eighth in another room. And uh, and. Uh, I never had a political upbringing. My dad, my father only had a sixth grade education. My mother was an immigrant from Slovenia. Anybody ever heard of it? It was then called Yugoslavia, but the Slovenes never thought of themselves as Yugoslavs. They thought of themselves as Slovenes. So my mother was an immigrant. My father was a coal miner for 20 some years in Iowa. Most people don't know that Iowa at one time was the third or fourth largest coal producing state in the nation. Um, and then, so that was my education, high school, Iowa State University. One of my dreams always at Iowa State, and probably is today, is that someday we're going to beat Kansas in basketball. <laughs> it's going to happen one of these days. <laughs> it's like the Cubs. I mean, we finally made it. Iowa State will defeat Kansas one day in basketball. It's going to happen someday. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Uh, talk a little bit about your time in the Navy. You were a pilot. I didn't realize that until I was doing research for today. Well, again, not much. I was a Navy pilot. Um, and um, uh, I was just telling President Gerard that uh, I was lucky I got to fly the two best airplanes the Navy had at the time, the F-8 Crusader, which was a single seat high-performance fighter, and then I transitioned from that to the F-4 Phantom, which was a two-seat twin-engine uh, fighter interceptor. Um, so I was very lucky. I got to, uh, well, I'll tell you how I, that came about. Well, I always wanted to fly. First time I ever got in an airplane, I was 19 years old. It was a Navy. I was in ROTC. And so they sent an old DC-3 to fly us someplace. So that was my first time in an airplane. It was an old DC-3. Uh, but I always wanted to fly. And uh, in 1957, I was a junior in high school, and there was a story in the Des Moines Register with a picture. And it was a story about this transcontinental flight broke a speed record. It had a picture of this plane. It was F-8 Crusader, and a picture of the pilot, Major John Glenn. I clipped it out, put that above my bed, and I said, that's what I want to do. I want to fly that airplane. It's funny how life is. So I was lucky. I got to fly the F-8. Uh, I got over 1,000 hours in it, as a matter of fact. And, um, and then later, went to Congress, and later went to the Senate and served with John Glenn in the United States Senate, the only two F-8 pilots in the entire United States Senate. So we used to always have talk about our time flying that airplane, but still there was that, that, that picture that I had of him in that F-8 that got me thinking about that's the kind of plane I wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. What got you into politics, public service, and talk a little bit about your time in the U.S. House? Well, as I said, I'd never had any politics in my house. No, we never knew politicians and stuff. Although, I can still remember. <laughs> well, let's see, I would have been, what, I would have been probably eight, nine years old. And, um, and my father, who by that time was pretty old. My father was 54 when I was born. That's another story about that. <laughs> I always say my father was one of these old Irishmen who thought that wakes and funerals were joyous events to be attended as often as possible, but weddings to be avoided at all possible costs. Um, 
Uh, but I remember it was 19, well, I didn't know at the time I thought about it a lot. Uh, but uh, I was in school, and my father, some people showed up at our house in coming. And they had an old Model A. <laughs> and my dad and his brother and a couple of others, I remember they got packed up for a long trip. They were going someplace to see somebody. And they came back late that day, and, and of course, uh, and my dad and those kind of people, old coal miners and stuff, they drank a lot. So they come home, and sitting around drinking, talking about seeing Harry Truman. I had no idea who Harry Truman was, but it just stuck in my mind. That, and they took this long trip from coming to Dexter, Iowa. Uh, I read about it later. I didn't know about it. The National Plowing Contest. And Truman spoke to like 100,000 people showed up at the National Plowing Contest in Dexter, Iowa in 1948. And I remember my dad and these men talking about it, about Truman and this and that, drinking whiskey. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know. So I didn't get involved in politics until um, I had a little stint working on a congressional campaign when I was in high school. Um, well, I'll tell you, there were two women, Catherine McNerney and Helena Hawkins. Helena Hawkins' son was the state chair of the Iowa Democratic Party. I didn't know if I was a Democrat or not. I knew my dad liked Roosevelt and he liked Truman, but that was about it. Um, um, but they got me working on a, and this is an interesting story, uh, the congressman was Neil Smith and he served for years. Alive. He's 97 years old, but he served for years as a congressman from Iowa, and so this would have been 1958, so I'm a senior in high school, and there was a primary, and he, neither one won the primary, so it went to convention. So they had a convention to decide which of these two people were going to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. Helena Hawkins and Kathy McNerney were sort of running his operation. And they had a convention in Des Moines, and they had me, and I learned a valuable lesson. They had me stand by the door when people come in and check off names, a piece of paper, when people came in. So when we come in, I'd write to check off who they were. Because the doors closed at something like, I don't know, I forget, 7 o'clock or 7.30 or something like that. They shut it. If you weren't in by then, you, you couldn't be part of the convention. So I was there checking off all these names. They shut the doors. I turned over my papers to Catherine McNerney, and they're sitting at this table, and they're going over names and stuff like this. And all of a sudden, she said, well, we've won. I thought, how could you know you won? You haven't even had a vote. <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting your people there. huh? They knew who they had to get there, and when I checked off all the names, they knew they had enough people there to win, and they won. Learned a very valuable lesson about preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, you worked uh, for a congressman for a, for a while, and then you ran for Congress. Tell us about all of that. So this guy that I checked off the names on, I, I didn't know him. I don't know that I ever even met him at that time. But later on, when I got out of the Navy and went to law school, in Washington, I worked in his office and went to law school at night. That same congressman, that same guy I worked for. Then later on, I get elected to Congress and served with him. Later on, I get elected to the Senate, and I go to the Senate, and as certain musical chairs would have it, I became chairman of the Appropriations Committee on Labor, Health, Human Services, and Education on the Senate side, and guess who was the chairman on the House side? Congressman Neil Smith, that same guy I had worked for all those many years before when I was in high school. So here we are sitting as equals. Well, I mean, Senate always sat a little higher than I was. <laughs> but uh, so that was, that was that, yeah. You were elected in 1974. 74. Is that correct? Watergate baby. Okay. Yeah. What, uh, what memories do you have from your time in the House? 
Well, um, I remember running and losing and then running and winning in 74. Uh, and I, you know, I've, I've, I've always been honest about this. I, I ran against a very popular guy, but I was an anti-war candidate. I had lost a lot of my friends in Vietnam. And then there was a little thing called the tiger cages in Vietnam that some of you may, you can look it up. <laughs> look up tiger cages, Vietnam. I was the person that uncovered the, the tiger cages in 1970. And because of that, because I'd lost so many of my friends in Vietnam, uh, I became an anti-war candidate in the Vietnam War. So, so I ran against this guy who was a, a big supporter of, of the war. Uh, so I, lo I ran against him in 72 and lost. Then I ran again in 74 and won. But I gotta be honest, if it weren't for Watergate, I probably would never have won. It was just a big landslide. And um, so I was able to win and then win re-election after that. Um, but I remember, uh, uh, again, things, things happen oddly. So I'm in Congress, I'm a freshman, and a freshman congressman is pretty low on the totem pole. But I got involved with some human rights groups. The Washington Office on Latin America, and something called the Center for International Policy and the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, anyway, there's another here and there, there. But they wanted to get someone to offer an amendment on the foreign aid bill that would incorporate human rights in our foreign aid programs. In other words, tying our foreign aid to a country's respect for basic human rights as enunciated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations. I don't know why they picked on me, but I guess they didn't think it was going to go anywhere, so get Harkin to do it. He's a freshman. So the, and I'm not on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm on the Agriculture Committee. So I offered this amendment on the, on the House floor and a big debate ensued, and we won. <laughs> it won through an odd coalition of liberals and conservatives. The conservatives who were opposed to foreign aid thought if this got on there, it might kill foreign aid. <laughs> the liberals wanted on there because if foreign aid went through, they wanted it tied to human rights. <laughs> the moderates were kind of caught in the middle. But that's how it passed. And it wasn't in the Senate bill, it was in the House bill. And then it went to conference. And uh, we were able to prevail in conference and keep it on uh, due to a couple of people uh, that were there at the time. Chuck Percy, who was a senator from Illinois, and Hubert Humphrey, who had been vice president, was back in the Senate at the time. And they were helpful. And so it became Section 116D of the Foreign Assistance Act, still there, which conditioned foreign aid on human rights. And out of that came the Human Rights Office that was set up. Jimmy Carter always took credit for this, but it wasn't Jimmy Carter. <laughs> President Gerald Ford signed it in the law. This was 1975. But Carter did set up the Human Rights Office as a result of this legislation, that's true. Uh, but then followed other human rights amendments, 502B, which is conditioned military sales and stuff. The first one was economic assistance, then we got on the military. So here I am, a freshman, and I get a major piece of legislation done. And I'm not even on the committee. Um, so that's what I remember from my house days. And then most of the time I spent working on agriculture and some science. I was on the Science and Technology Committee also at that time. But that's basically it. When did you decide to run for the United States Senate? And uh, what was that first race like? Who was that? Where's the author of this book I was just talking? Oh, yeah, just telling you about, about uh, 
<clears throat> so I had a tough congressional district, Western Iowa. Very conservative, very Republican. Here I am, a liberal Democrat. So every two years, <laughs> it was just, <laughs> it was tough sledding. And so about 1982, I figured upper out for me. Bob Ray, who was a very popular uh, governor for many years in Iowa, decided to retire in 1982. So I thought, there, I'm going to run for governor. So I kind of started going around Iowa. Mind you, I just had a congressional district in one part of Iowa, so I went to places of maybe more liberal persuasions like the University of Iowa and <laughs> places like that to see if I could get support to run for governor. Well, there was a woman by the name of Roxanne Conlon who had established the, um, helped establish the Iowa Women's Political Caucus, and she was Jimmy Carter's U.S. Attorney for Iowa. I think one of the first women in the country to be U.S. Attorney. Very popular, very bright. Uh, so as I went around thinking to run for governor, they were all supporting Roxanne. So I finally dawned on me I could never beat her in a primary. So I just tucked my tail and went back to the house. Ran into, saw Paul Simon. Now Paul Simon was a congressman from Illinois. He and I came to the house together in 1974. So I was commiserating with him about this. And he said, oh, you don't want to be governor. You want to go to the Senate? He said, uh, he said, I've got it all figured out. He said, this is 1982. 1983, by then, everybody will catch on to Reaganomics. And there'll be this big backlash. And 1984 will be just like 1974. There'll be this huge influx of Democrats going into the Senate, just like we did in the House in 1974. Oh, he convinced me. I thought, sound pretty good. So I started making plans to run for the Senate and laying the groundwork for running for the Senate and everything in 1984. Yeah, it was a big Democratic year, all right. Wait a minute, you don't know? It was a huge Republican landslide. Ronald Reagan got elected in a landslide. <laughs> Democrats didn't do worth a darn. We're still a minority in the Senate, but only two Democrats beat Republicans that year, Paul Simon and me. <laughs> go figure. Uh, go figure. Uh, so that's how I got in the Senate, because I couldn't run for governor. And Simon convinced me we were going to run this, ride this landslide in. Whew. Boy, that was, a, that, was, that was tough. <laughs> tough. Tell us a little bit about, uh, and I, I want to go into some depth on this because it's a topic of great significance to Senator Dole and, and the work we do here. And we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the ADA a, a couple of years ago That's with right. a very uh, detailed uh, set of programs and exhibit. But talk a little bit about why you came to sponsor the Americans with Disabilities Act and, and, and talk a little bit about the fight to get it through, because it was very nuanced and complicated, I think. Yes, nuanced and very complicated. First of all, I just want you to know, I spent two hours with Bob Dole on Friday, visiting with him. I had been in Washington before, and he'd been at Walter Reed, and hadn't been doing well, and I'd been trying to go see him. Uh, but Mo Taggart, his aide for many, many years, kept calling me back, said, no, you can't come today. Every day I'd have a plan, I couldn't go. Finally, I had left, came to Iowa, and I was around for several, ten days or so. I went back to Washington this last week and called up Mo, and she said, well, he's back in the Watergate, and uh, yeah, he'd like to see you. So I set it up for Friday afternoon. So uh, so I went to him at 1.45 Friday afternoon. I showed up there thinking that I was going to spend about, oh, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Two hours later, Mo comes to pick me up, get me out of the room. <laughs> It was just a wonderful get-together with Bob. And uh, uh, he said, oh, yeah, you'll like that. That Bill Lacey, he's great. He does a great job running the Institute. He loves this Institute. I thanked him for getting this award. He said, well, I didn't have anything to do with it. They all did that. <laughs> That's said, actually not true but, for but the he, record. But, no, but, but it, only in the way Dole is, as he said, but I didn't veto it. 
I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, fine, thanks. Uh, uh, so this goes back quite a while. See, when I came to the Senate, Senator Dole was majority leader. And then sometime after that, the Democrats came, and then he became minority leader. The first person to ever introduce the Americans with Disabilities Act was not me. It was Senator Lowell Weicker of Connecticut, a Republican senator. But he sought me out, and I was his first co-sponsor. <laughs> but then Lowell Weicker lost an election. And after he lost the election, then it fell to me to reintroduce it, which I did in 1988, and, and saw it through. Uh, but in those early days, uh, and I, like I said, I didn't know Bob Dole very well. He'd been on agriculture, and I'd been on the Ag Committee in the House, and periodically we would have something on agriculture, on an Ag Bill or something like that. But I can't say that I knew him at all, I knew who he was. So I come to the Senate. Now, I want to tell a little side story, but I'll get to that in a second. And so... We start working on the Americans with Disabilities Act, and someone said to me, do you ever read Bob Dole's maiden speech in the Senate? I said, no, no, never occurred to me. When Bob Dole came to the Senate in 1969, giving your maiden speech on the Senate floor at that time was a big deal. Usually you'd have to wait several months before you could speak on the Senate floor. And when you did, senators would come and listen. And usually what you spoke about in your maiden speech is sort of this is who I am, and this is what I want to do in the Senate. If you've never read it, go back and get it. You can get it here at the Institute, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Audrey can find that somewhere. Uh, his maiden speech on the Senate floor was about disability rights, and about people with disabilities and discrimination against people with disabilities. It's a beautiful speech, 1969. Wow. Blew me away. So, so working on the bill, I said, I... I got to get to know this Bob Dole. <laughs> so he's minority leader. And so Weicker and I and others see him and get him on the bill, get him behind it. And uh, so that began a two year uh, relationship with Senator Dole on this issue and getting the bill done and being very helpful and getting Republicans on the bill uh, as well. But I have to tell you my first Dole story. I get elected to the Senate, it's 1985. I'm getting sworn into the Senate. Uh, it's January 3rd, 4th, I don't know, early January. I have my whole family there. And I have my brother who is deaf. Hmm? So they have a place up in the, up in the Senate gallery. Uh, so I had my, my three brothers there. Uh, and my, my, but my brother Frank was deaf, so I had arranged for an interpreter to be in the gallery with him to interpret my speech, or my, my swearing in, my swearing in. And so we had a little reception beforehand, and so we went up to the gallery, they all sat down, I got the interpreter there from Gallaudet, I sit there, I go back down to the floor, it's the noon hour is approaching, I'm not a senator yet, and all of a sudden, um, one of the uh, cloakroom people come up to me. I'm sorry, outside guards, you know, the uh, sergeant of arms people come up to me and said, uh, by the way, um, they had to take your interpreter out of the, out of the gallery. So I kind of walked down the center floor and I looked up. I saw my family. I saw my brother saying, the interpreter's not there. So I... God, I'm going to miss my swear again. I run upstairs uh, to the gallery, and I talk to the doorkeeper. No, so I'm sorry. Uh, if you're in the gallery, you must be seated. You can't stand. Well, she was a woman, had to stand to interpret for him. She can't sit. So she was standing on the stair, the steps, by where the seats are. I thought, oh, my God, my brother. She was standing there. So I went right back down. I went to Senator Dole. Mind you, he's the majority leader of the Senate. And I just got elected. I'm still not sworn in. So I went up to him. Senator Dole. Harkin, I'm from Iowa. 
I'm just getting sworn in. <laughs> He probably doesn't like the fact that I beat one of his Republican senators. <laughs> and, and I said, Senator Dole, I, I, I got to tell you, because I said, I got to tell you what's happened. I, I've got my family up here, and I have a brother who's deaf, and I had an interpreter up there to interpret for him. And the doorkeeper said, she can't be there and stand and interpret. Dole looked up, so where they said, I said, I sent him right up there. Howie, come here, you got Howie Green. Howie Green was his guy. Howie, come here. He said, go up there and tell them to let that interpreter in right now. Well, majority leader of the Senate, he can do whatever he wants, right? <laughs> so they let the interpreter in. My brother could understand, understand everything that was being done down there. So that was my first time with You know, that kind of gets at your heart, you know that, when something like that happens. So I, uh, I had a very high opinion of Bob Dole after that. And then after that, and we started working on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And he became a great partner in that, great partner. What were some of the challenges that you faced in getting the ADA passed? Some of the coalitions you had to build? Well, coalitions, uh, business community, but we got them on board. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce supported it. Well, we had to work out a lot of stuff. You know, you just work those things out. And then we had hearings. I was chair of the subcommittee that had all the hearings going stretching over about an 18 month period of time, almost two years. Uh, but we couldn't get it out of the House. We passed it in the Senate in September of 89. Andy, is that about right? September of 89. And then it got stuck in the House. We couldn't get it out of the House going on. There's an organization called ADAPT, right back here, good old ADAPT. ADAPT is to the disability community what the Marines are to the military. <laughs> you get the picture? <laughs> they hit the beach first, <laughs> they take all the fire, and uh, soften up the beachhead for everybody. Uh, ADAPT, through the 70s and 80s, was the group that brought a lot of attention to especially mobility problems. They're the ones that got a lot of national attention when they would lay under the wheels of Greyhound buses so they couldn't move. Uh, they were the ones that would chain themselves. One time they chained themselves across uh, Independence Avenue, or is it Constitution? The street that runs by the Capitol. <laughs> I remember I saw that. They, they chained themselves all the way across it at rush hour, traffic and works in D.C. And so my aide, Bobby Silverstein, came and said, you've got to come out and see this. So I went out. We were working on the ADA at the time. I mean, we'd already passed it. Couldn't get it out of the house. So they chained themselves. So they brought the police up with the big bolt cutters to cut the chains and everything. Then they brought the paddy wagons to haul all these people in wheelchairs down to book them. And they wouldn't fit in the paddy wagons. And so they all started to say, hey, see, you can't even arrest us. <laughs> that was ADAP. So one day in March of 90, late March of 90, I got a phone call from the head of ADAP, God bless him, Bob Kafka, Vietnam veteran, has been arrested probably more times than any person I've ever met in my lifetime, uses a wheelchair, uh, so Kafka called me in the morning and said, Senator, we're going to get that bill out of the house for you. I said, well, Bob, that's, that's nice. That's good. Yeah, yeah. What, what's going on? He said, watch the news tonight. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> what is he going to do? Because they would do some outrageous things. I remember one time they changed themselves in the hallway of the, of the Dirksen building around Jesse Helms' office. <laughs> because Helms wouldn't let the ADA get through. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> anyway, so I said, well, I'll watch the news tonight. I'm over in the Capitol later. I told Bobby this. So some, here, Kafka's a smart guy, very clever. He called the press, and he said, today's going to be the biggest demonstration in history in front of the Capitol of people with disabilities. It's going to be huge. So he calls all the press. 
to tell them this. You don't want to miss this. There's going to be fireworks at the cap. Only, as only Kafka could do. <laughs> I found about this later. So Bobby in the middle of the day comes and says, you've got to come out and see what's going on. So I went out. Here's what Kafka did. He got all the press there with their cameras and everything. And about, well, I forget now, what, 12, 15 people in wheelchairs. Where's, where's this big demonstration? They all rolled their wheelchairs up the Capitol steps. And on Kafka's command, they all fell out of their wheelchairs and crawled up the steps of the Capitol with the TV cameras going and the photographers taking pictures. There's this little girl, girl, girl um, Jennifer Heelan, eight years old, crawling up the steps of the Capitol, camera in her face, camera by her, and a policeman. Big police comes up and says, oh, young miss, you can't, you gotta go, you can't come. She said, well, this is the only way I get it. She said, arrest that guy walking up the steps. Wow. This made news all over America. About 30 days later, we got the bill through the House of Representatives. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be on the opposite side of that one. Uh, it was put up in different committees. We got it all put together, got it through the House. So that was ADAPT. So I always say, God bless ADAPT. I, I, I told Bob Kafka once, I always go to the annual thing you have in Washington. I told Bob, I said, you know, now I'm out of the Senate. I said, yo, Bob, you know, I've never been arrested in my lifetime. He said, stick with me. <laughs> uh, Senator, you've talked about being elected in 84. You left the Senate in 2015, about 21 years. Uh, tell us how the Senate changed in that period of time. I thought it was 30 years. Boy, that is. I can't add, apparently. Did I make a mistake? No, it's 30 years. <laughs> it was 30 years. Go ahead, Bill. What's that? Oh, how did the Senate change during your career? A lot. A lot. Uh, just the association with one another broke down. The money chase got to be so important. Senators spend most of their time, if they have any, whatever free time they have, raising money now on the telephone. Um, no one's there Monday because they're out raising money. You're there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, you're gone to raise money. Um, we used to have, I told you this earlier, there is in the, on the first floor of the Capitol under the Senate, there was a dining room, a small dining room, just for senators. Couldn't have staff, spouses, or friends, just senators. We'd go down and have sandwich or soup, salad, lunch. We'd sit around a big table there, Republicans and Democrats, no seating order. And it was a way to get to know one another. You know, we'd tell stories, jokes. Someone was always spoofing somebody about some dumb thing they might have said or something like that. But it was all just human relations. This is a great lunch. Well, that room doesn't even exist any longer. Senators don't get together for lunch any longer. And they can't because, well, they're not there Monday. Tuesday is, are the caucus lunches. Democrats and Republicans have their different caucuses. And then Wednesday and Thursday lunches are fundraisers. You go out in town and have fundraisers. So, uh, we don't have that kind of relationship we used to have. I will say one other thing for the record. When I first got to the Senate, uh, on the Republican side, we had people like uh, Mark Hatfield from Oregon, Dan Evans from Washington, former governor, who, by the way, long before the ADA had, as governor, signed into law a, uh, a disability rights bill in the state of Washington. That was Dan Evans, Republican. Uh, Durnberger, Abe from Minnesota, Dole from Kansas, Danforth from St. Louis, Dick Luger from Indiana, Arlen Specter from Pennsylvania, Mac Mathias from Maryland, 
Lil Wiker from Connecticut. Now, why did I raise all those names? They would be what you might call today a liberal Republican. I thought they were pretty conservative. And on the Democratic side, we had conservative Democrats from the South. You know, we had the Hal Heflins and the Priors and uh, actually in those days, uh, Dick Shelby later became a Republican. But uh, we, we had, you know, there were, so, and there were, so what I'm saying is there were conservative Republicans, moderate Republicans, liberal Republicans. There were conservative Democrats, moderate Democrats, liberal Democrats. And in that mix, you could get things done. That's not so today. It's like two separate camps. <clears throat> two separate camps. Uh, and that's just a shame. That's the money chase, uh, the breakdown in relationships uh, has really destroyed that. And, and, and you know, politics, governance, universities, <laughs> businesses, it's human relations. How you get along with people, how you build understanding and friendships. I mean, I so many times. I mean, I, I've, I've had. I said earlier, one of my great debating. We used to have debates in the Senate floor. Imagine that. We actually could stand on the Senate floor and debate. One of my great debating partners was uh, was Phil Graham from Texas, who had been a Democrat, then became a Republican, <laughs> but he's a smart guy. And he loved to debate. And we could stand there and debate each other on the Senate floor. You'll never see that happen again today. It does not happen. And Phil and I remain friends to this day. Uh, uh, it's just a shame uh, that you can't have those kind of give and takes that we used to have on the Senate floor. The money chase, the breakdown of relationships, the lack of debate, legitimate debate. Everybody that goes gives a speech and then they walk off the floor. There's no such thing as a debate any longer on the Senate floor. Um, those, those. We've got to get back to some kind of a, a relationship. I would say probably Bob Dole and voting record in mind are probably, well, not, not, not polar opposites, but I, he was more, much more conservative, I was much more liberal. But we were friends. We would talk to one another. We would kid one another. Make... Well, he made more jokes about me than I ever made about him. <laughs> <laughs> because he was really good at it. Uh, what's that kind of thing? You don't have to be an enemy uh, because you don't agree on a policy, but you work it out. You work things out. You discuss it. You have staff. Staff gets together. You work things out, and finally you make an agreement. I mean, that's an, that's an art to that. It's the art of human relations. Uh, uh, boy, that's, that's just that's the way it's changed. You kind of did a good job setting up my next question. Talk a little bit about Senator Dole's legacy. Well, a long legacy first a legacy of his wartime service and what he did after wartime. I mean, they really were the greatest generation, weren't they? That whole World War II, I mean, you know, they went and they served, came back, and then they just went on to do wonderful things, a lot of them. Uh, I think his legacy, I mean, uh, first, as a, as a perennial, look, I just told some young people, I said, if I had a nugget for them or rest, I said, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> run for office and don't, and don't wait forever and don't worry about losing. So here's Bob, he ran, got to the Senate, as I said, gave that maiden speech, ran for vice president in 1976, <clears throat> uh, that year, but that didn't deter him, he just kept right on going. Uh, became a key player in the United States Senate, then became majority leader in the Senate in 81. Okay, am I right? I think 1981 becomes majority leader of the United States Senate. Yes, that's right, because he was a majority leader when I went there in 85. That's exactly right. 
Or had Howard Baker left at that time? Howard, Howard Baker was there, I think, until 84. Okay, then Senator right. Lowe became majority right. leader after Howard <clears throat> Baker. That's right. That's right. Um, but even as majority leader, um, I remember we had a farm bill on the floor, and uh, we were having some tough times in agriculture at that time. A lot of farmers were committing suicide. This is mid-'80s. We, we had a farm credit bill we had to get through to help farmers with their debt load. That was 1987, I think. And, uh, and, and Bob was very helpful on that. Uh, <laughs> can I tell another interesting little story? Please do. Well, I think it's no secret that Jesse Helms and I never really got along. <laughs> really <well. laughs> So Jesse is now the chair of the Ag Committee in the Senate. I'm on the Ag Committee. We're working on this credit bill. That's what popped into my mind. And um, I knew that Senator Dole and I thought a lot alike on this issue of farm credit. Well, Dole was on the Ag Committee. But because he was minority leader of the Senate, he couldn't be chair. So Jesse Helms is chair, even though Dole outranks him. Hmm? Got that? So Helms is gone one day from the Ag Committee, and so Dole is chairing it. And we sit around a big table. We didn't have a dais. We sat around a big table. Mind you, I'm just a freshman now, so I'm way down at the end. And I tried to get recognition. And I said, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, well, Dole didn't see me. Probably didn't hear me. And I said, Mr. Real Chairman, There was a sort of pause. <laughs> Dole looked at me and said, yes, I said, yes, Mr. Real, because I referred to him as the real chairman of the Ag Committee. Well, this got back to Jesse, <laughs> who read me the riot act later on. <clears throat> I saw Bob Dole in the Capitol. And I said, hey, Bob, I said, I got, I got a real problem with Jesse about what I said. He said, yeah, he said, I heard what you said, and I thought, that's not going to go over very well with Jesse Helms. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I don't want to be all, always a bow. He said, oh, I said, I'll, I'll calm him down. I'll, I'll, I'll calm him down. So anyway, he could do things like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as minority leader, he was still able to get Democrats together. Uh, going into the 90s, uh, and then I think in 92, did he try again for president in 92? I'm trying to think. 88, 96. Oh, 88. Mm -hmm. 88, that's right, 1988. That's right. And that was 88, and uh, George H.W. won that one uh, uh, with Quayle. Then he didn't in 92, but he right, ran again in 96. Correct. That's right, ran in 96. What happened in 92? Bush was renominated. Oh, that's right, of course. General election. That's right, that's right, general election. He was renominated, that's of course. But during those years, uh, and then when we were implementing the ADA, uh, he was always our, you know, could go to. There's this famous meeting, it's in a book someplace. Not mine, I haven't written one, but it's in a book somewhere. Whose is it? About this famous meeting in the Capitol once with uh, uh, some of the administration people and Kennedy and me and Bob Dole and others. And uh, Dole was able to, well, let's, let me just say there were fireworks. And Dole was able to calm things down and keep us all on track. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the book. Audrey can find it for you. Yeah, we'll find it and let we'll everybody it. know at some There's point. There's a story about that, that famous meeting <clears throat> in the Capitol. Uh, but I think his legacy, I would say, one, he was a great legislator. 
because he knew how to work with people with a goal in mind to get it done. Willing to compromise, probably a dirty word today, but he would cooperate. Uh, someone said once, cooperation is the essence of civilization. You know, it is. So we, we could cooperate uh, and get things done. Um, and he always did it with a good sense of humor. Uh, I once, uh, I once introduced uh, Bob Dole. I said, you know, I said, you know, a lot of senators try themselves at jokes and things like that. I said, they're not very good at it. They think they're funny, but not very good at it. I said, but actually, I said, Bob Dole is actually as funny as he thinks he is. <laughs> <laughs> I was introducing him at some, 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 some event or something like that. But a great wit, a great wit. Uh, great public servant. Uh, don't see many of them anymore. But a great legacy of cooperation, of, of, uh, of uh, understanding that what it takes to get legislation and always moving something forward. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the Harkin Institute. Well, the Harkin Institute, thankfully, we have the president here of Drake University, Marty Barton, and uh, our director, Joseph Jones, and our first director, Mark Saturnus, uh, who is now the chair of the board of the Harkin Institute. Um, I brag on these people. First of all, Mark Saturnus was the first female chief justice of the Iowa Supreme Court in the state of Iowa. And so we were lucky to have her, and a Drake University law school graduate, I might say. Uh, and uh, uh, now, as I said, is the chair of our board. Uh, Drake University is a private university in Des Moines, Iowa. Not quite as big as Kansas University. Uh, but the Harkin Institute is called the uh, 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 Harkin Institute of Public Policy and Citizen Engagement. In other words, unlike an institute on politics, we're involved in policy development, and citizen engagement. And that stems really from our caucus system in Iowa, trying to get more people out to get involved and uh, in, in, in engaged uh, in, our, in our government, not just on congressional or senate level, but local levels. Uh, as a matter of fact, we practice what we preach. Joseph Jones is the director, and he's running for the city council in where? Windsor Heights. In Windsor Heights. There you go. It's a nonpartisan, nonpartisan. So, see, so uh, we practice what we preach <laughs> uh, to get more citizens involved um, uh, uh, actively at all levels, local, uh, local level, state, federal level. Uh, we have one division of the, of the institute is the disability part because of the ADA. A year ago, the institute sponsored the first Harkin Summit on Employment of People with Disabilities, the first international summit on employment of people with disabilities in Washington, D.C. That was last year, in November of last year. We had about 30 countries represented. We had some 30, some 40, some businesses involved, and we had 100 and, I don't know, 175 participants, something like that. And the conference was basically, let me back up. We've, been, we've made a lot of great strides in, 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 in the four goals of the ADA, full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. Economic self-sufficiency is the one we haven't done very well on, folks. Two out of every three people with disabilities are still unemployed, looking for work. Over 60% unemployment rate. So we haven't done very So I, when I retired, I wanted to focus on that, just employment and not just make work jobs for people with disabilities, but I mean competitive integrated employment, mostly in the private sector. So that's what this conference was about, was to get different businesses together, government, disability advocates, to talk about how we accelerate employment of people with disabilities, not only in the United States, but globally. 
It was a great success last year. This year, well, the second one is next week. You can look it up. Look up harkinsummit.org, or you can go to the Harkin Institute and look it up there. So the second one is next Thursday and Friday. We now have 240 participants. We have how many countries? We have 40? We have over 40 countries now coming. And we have a lot of businesses involved. We have everything from Microsoft to, to, to uh, Walgreens to um, uh, just got General Motors on board, General Motors. Plus, we have the Ford Foundation now as a partner and the World Bank. Uh, SAP, Cisco Systems, uh, uh, a lot of business. Wal Walmart, what? What? High V from Iowa. Yes, is a yes. Uh, Walmart. So we have a lot of corporate sponsors, and that's good because we're looking for employment in the private sector. Uh, so that's and now we have a new division starting on nutrition, wellness, and 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 prevention, because I spend a lot of my time working on those issues also on the health committee, and so we just we got a nice grant from an individual to set this up. We now have just hired a full-time person, a, a PhD nutritionist, to run this. And we'll be hiring some fellows. So now we're going to get into policy development on prevention and wellness and healthfulness. Along the lines that I have said since 1992 when I ran for president. Some of you may have missed that, by the way. <laughs> Fortunately for all involved, including me and my family, it was short-lived. Uh, but I said at the time, in 1992, we don't have a health care system in America, we have a sick care system. We need a true health care system where people are kept healthy, where you prevent illness, not just treat it. And so, again, this is what we're looking at here with this part of the Institute, to work with uh, health care professionals, others to, to, again, to advance the Prevention and Public Health Fund that's in the Affordable Care Act, by the way. A lot of people don't know that, but it's in part of the Affordable Care Act. So we're setting up, now we're doing labor and employment and also retirement security. So those are kind of the four things that the Institute's looking at and uh, developing policy, getting civic engagement, citizen engagement uh, involved, involved in, in, in that. Uh, did I miss anything, Joseph? So I think, no? I'm okay? Yeah. All right. Did I say anything wrong? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Check. okay, I have one final question, then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So we'll take some time to do that in just a moment. But, Senator, we have a lot of young people here today from not only KU but Drake. What would you say to them about the importance of getting involved in public service and politics? Well, if you don't like the way things are going, then don't do anything. Because it'll probably continue to get worse. I mean, yeah. I rephrase it. If you like the way things are now, don't do anything because it'll continue getting worse. If you don't like the way things are going now, you've got to do something about it. You can't leave it up to people. You know, I, I'm a has-been. Um, my 40 years are there and gone. And don't wait for somebody else to do it. Don't think, well, I'd do it, but somebody else is more qualified than I am or better educated than I am. No, no, no. Don't wait for someone else to do it. And get involved when you're young. And don't be afraid of losing. And don't think about it. You've got to do it just at the Senate level or House level. I've said many times, and I mean it, Probably the most important office in America is your local school board. What's the turnout for local school board elections? 20%, 10%? And you, why do people run for school board? Usually they're mad at the coach because they lost football games or something like that. <laughs> school boards, local city elections, city council. You'd be amazed at what a city council can do. <laughs> or county office. A lot of things can happen at the county level. State legislative races. Uh, we need a whole new generation of young people <clears throat> that are kind of willing to throw caution to the wind, 
forget about making a lot of money, uh, but see public service as a high calling, uh, not something dirty. You don't have to go down that path. You don't have to paint your opponent as evil uh, and the devil. You don't have to do things like that. Um, we need a whole new generation of young people that will sort of raise the bar, raise the bar in public office uh, and approach it in that way. Uh, like I say, you may not win the first time. I didn't either. I told a group earlier, I, I worked on a congressional campaign, or I worked on a Senate campaign for my history professor, he lost. I later worked on a, on a governor's campaign and he lost to Bob Ray. And then I worked on a, another congressional campaign and he lost. I ran my own congressional campaign and I lost. I finally won. <laughs> so you can't give up. <laughs> uh, and, you, and you can't let a loss set you back. You just got to keep going. Uh, so that's why I say to young people, public service at all levels. You can do good things. Good things for our country. Good things for your community. Uh, and you can look back and, and sort of see a legacy. Like Bob Dole can look back and see, my God, he did a lot of good things that live on for a long time. Live on for a long time. Uh, and like I said, you don't have to do it. You don't have to be president of the United States or senator or congressman. You can do it at the local level. So don't stand by and wait for somebody else. Do it while you're young. We need young people involved. Your talent, your brains. And I think young people know how to get along. Maybe better than some of us old timers. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions uh, from the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand. Mr. Feather, Mr. McGinnis will come by. And don't wave at me. Don't try to get my attention. You need to get their attention. So if you have a question, get their attention. We'll go to the back. Thank you for your visit, honoring us by being here. I particularly took note of your uh, reporting on the uh, restaurant you had for the senators, how you could sit down and meet each other in that informal. I'm sure that was very productive and very significant. I have often wondered whoever gave the Congress the right to seat Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other. Seems to me we elect re representatives. And they could be seated by, oh, I suppose age, weight, or, or, I or some. Say, what do you say? Well, I suppose the best one would be to have a lottery, but uh, have them seated, intermingling so they do get acquainted and do the, some of the negotiating that can be done without formal debates. Okay, the question was, who, who gave the right for Republicans to be seated on one side of the Democrats Senate and Democrats on the other? Blame our mother country, England. The House of Commons has thus always been. And, and because the conservatives and liberals or the labor and whatever they are. Tories. Tory, thank you. Huh? What is it? The Whigs and the Tories, is that what it was early on? Well, they separated, and we just adopted that from England. It's not written in any law. It's just a custom, simply a custom. But we inherited that from England, and it's just always been that way. Um, and that's true in the House of Representatives, too. Democrats on one side, Republicans the other. Uh, except that when... Um, <laughs> When the House, if there's an overabundance of one or the other, they do spill across on the other side, but they hug the aisle. <laughs> Middle aisle. Okay, Alec, do you have a question? Great honor, Senator. Um, um, could you could you talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the 2008 Restoration Act of the ADA and um, the work Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014, which, where you were chairman of the committee that helped put that together. I'm just getting over a cold. What was that? Yeah. Um, the question was, uh, could you talk a little bit about the 
Was it Restoration Anthony Act of 2008? The ADA, the, the ADA Restoration Act of 2008 that oh. was worked on. Oh. Okay. Yeah. We call that the Clint Eastwood bill. Been around a long time. <clears throat> and it's, it's in the Congress. It's, it's been there since it kind of rears its head every couple of years or so. Uh, we call it the Clint Eastwood bill. This happened back in 1998 or 99. Clint Eastwood had a resort out in California. And he was mad because of the ADA and he had to change some things. <clears throat> he didn't like it. <clears throat> so the first time that bill popped up was sometime after that. And... Um, and the idea behind it, anyway, but it didn't get anywhere. And then years went by and it popped up again and went down. So now it's back again. I think it was introduced by a congressman from Maine, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's the bill. <clears throat> says it, On the surface, it sounds logical. It says that before a, an individual can can file a complaint against a business for not complying with the ADA, that individual must first give written notice to the business, must stipulate how it affected that person's ability to gain access. It must, with specificity, cite the title and paragraph of the ADA that is violated. Um, there may be a couple more things, but the burden is on the person with a disability to come up with all that. And if any of that is wrong, the defendant, the business, can just kick it back. Say, it's the wrong section of the code, you're wrong here, then you've got to start over again. But let's say you got everything right and you filed it. The business then has 90 days to respond, just to respond. And after that response, if there's still a violation, the business has 180 days to make substantial progress. What does that mean? Well, when I'm asked about this, I say, well, you know, first of all, it shifts the burden. Secondly, secondly, it's been 27 years since this bill was passed. <laughs> People have had time to figure out what they need to do. Thirdly, thirdly, it rewards bad actors. So if I'm a business and I don't want to fix my doorway or I don't want to put in a bathroom or I don't want to let those people in my restaurant. I just won't do anything. Well, wait till somebody files a complaint. And then I'll kick it out and we'll run them around for a while. And then finally, maybe I'll have to do something. Or I'll have to make substantial progress, whatever that means. Yet, the business that was forthright and said, I want to comply with the ADA, I'm going to do these things, well, they look like a dummy. Why did you do all that for? You could have done nothing. There's one little twist on this also that I must be honest about. This came up, a case came up, a, a, someone had filed this complaint, or sued, had sued Eastwood in court. Well, sued him for 500 some thousand dollars or something like that. <clears throat> Eastwood won the jury trial. And he should have. It's a lot for me to say. Why should he have won that? Because we put in the ADA, and this was one of the compromises we made, and I thought it was a good compromise. You cannot get monetary damages if you're filing a complaint against a business. All you can get is performance. No monet that then prevents lawyers. <laughs> from shopping around, finding somebody and saying, hey, 
I can make you a lot of money. I, of course, I get 30% or 40% or 50%. And that's what happened in California. California has a state law that allows for monetary damages, not federal. We didn't allow it under the ADA. California and about two or three other states have allowed for monetary damages, so it allows for form shopping by uh, less than ethical lawyers. And so, and it turned out that this couple that had sued Clint Eastwood never even set foot in his place, never even went to his place. <laughs> even though in the, in the, during the trial it came out that even if they tried they could not get to the front desk because the front desk wasn't accessible. But he won on the damages. Um, so that's that bill. The bill basically would just upturn it. We can't control state law. Most states don't allow for monetary damages. I don't know what they are. There's like three states that have enacted laws to do that. I would think maybe they will think secondly about it now and maybe take that away. That's the Clint Eastwood bill. It's terrible legislation. And it's not going anywhere, okay? Uh, uh, through all of these iterations of it, we've always had the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on our side. Oh, by the way, there was a business in Des Moines, Iowa, on the east side of Des Moines not too long ago. Oh. The restaurant. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot the young man's name that filed the complaint. But <clears throat> filed a complaint, couldn't get in the restaurant. The court ordered, said after 26, it was asked you 26 years, you got to make some changes. Well, I don't know the owner of this business. I read later that someone informed him that, you know, after we passed the ADA, we put in the tax code. Senator Dole, that's another, I forgot about that. See, he was on finance committee. <laughs> so Dole helped us get in the, on the finance committee a provision that says if you make a change to comply with, a, with the Americans with Disabilities Act, you can get a tax credit, not a deduction, but a tax credit of up to 50% of the cost, up to $5,000. In other words, if you spent $10,000, you get a $5,000 tax credit, not a deduction. So it helps small businesses, like this little restaurant. I think it's probably going to cost him. Anyway, I heard that he said later, well, I didn't know that. If I'd known that, I might have done it earlier. Well, we have 12 TA centers, technical assistance centers in the United States, under the Department of Justice, set up under the ADA, that have been there for all these years. One's in Kansas City, handles this whole region. If you're a business and you want to comply, all you've got to do is call them up. Free of charge. They will come out, or maybe just on the phone if they don't have to make a site visit, and they'll tell you, yes, we have all the technical specs, all the things, yes, and they'll give you all the information you need, free of charge. So if Clint Eastwood really wants to comply, all he has to do is call the TA Center in San Francisco, and they'll be more than happy <laughs> to tell him what he needs to do to comply with the ADA. Those are all over the country. And so there's really no excuse, really, for not complying after all these years. There's really not, there's really no excuse for not complying. That's that bill. What was, you had another one? No, I thought, that's okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Um, Lawrence, could we get a little more volume on the uh, remote mics? I can't hear, I can't in. hear very well. I'm having trouble that. hearing up here. So uh, do we have another question? Oh, we got a question over here. <clears throat> Tom, can you hear me okay? I got you. All right. So the question that he asked was about the 2008 ADA Amendments Act where you overturn the Sutton Trilogy, the good, the oh, good yeah, law that yeah. passed. He just asked you to talk about the 2008 law that was good, not the Clint Eastwood one that we oh, don't want. Oh, I thought he was talking about the Clint Eastwood bill. This time. No, it's, it's, and then after you do that, I just, if you could just say a little bit more about the first President Bush, he didn't come up very much when you were talking about the ADA, and I just think it'd be interesting for you to think, I'm thinking particularly when he invited you over for drinks at the White House, you may want to tell that story. The person who asked that is Andy Imperato. Many years ago, uh, 
uh, right after we'd passed the ADA, Andy was on my staff, then he left and became the head of the American Association of Persons with Disabilities and was a president of that for a long time. He then left that, came back on my staff when I, uh, when I, in the Senate and worked for me basically until I retired. And Andy now is the executive director of something called the AUCD. It's the Association of University Centers on Disability. You have one here at Kansas University, right? And you have a person who runs it here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but... Uh, Terry Sjogren. There you go. And so we have one in every state. Some states have two, I think. California and New York have, but there's at least one AUCD in every state. And they do great work and are a great resource. So if anybody here at the Institute ever needs any information on all things pertaining to disability issues, you have the AUCD here right at Kansas University. Very lucky. I'm sorry, I thought he talked about this bill that came up. But, but the 2000, okay, 2008. So when the ADA passed, our first focus, I, I mentioned the four goals, right? Full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. The most important thing we thought to start to do in the 90s was accessibility. What good does it do to get a job if you can't even get to work? So buses, transportation, rail systems, um, uh, accessibility to the bathrooms, uh, accessibility became the big thing. We had to start changing the built environment. Ramps, widened doorways, just simple things like that. Uh, independent living, we started focusing also. Uh, uh, and then in 19, about the time we thought we were going to start working on employment, the Supreme Court on one day in 1999 handed down three decisions in one day. They're called the Sutton Trilogy. Uh, without going into the weeds on it, basically what it did, it threw a monkey wrench into what employers thought they needed to do or what, what their rights and responsibilities were in employment and also for people with disabilities. It just put a damper on employment of people with disabilities. Bob Dole and I were together at the Supreme Court the day that <clears throat> decision came down. <laughs> and I remember we walked out and the press was waiting for us. And one of the reasons cited was the lack of, of some kind of evidence, a state kind of evidence that we'd had on this. So we walked out. And uh, I remember Bob's press was there, terrible decision. Bob says, well, evidence. He said, we had hearings on it. We had, I, I forget. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't remember. We had 200 and some individual cases on this. I wish they'd tell us, what, what do they need? They need 300? They need 305? They need 325? <laughs> Bob Dole did his best. Uh, and, and so what happened then is we then said, well, we gotta, we've got to uh, start working on overturning this. It took us eight years. We started in uh, around 2000, I guess. And, um, and of course, Dole's out of the Senate by now, of course. But we sat together and listened to that darn thing in the Supreme Court. So it took us eight years. Finally, by 2008, we have put together the ADA Act amendments to overturn, to let the Supreme Court know what we wanted <laughs> in clear English. And, um, and we got it through the House and the Senate, signed into law by the second George Bush, George W. Bush. Well, I still, well, we had hoped that he was going to have a big signing for it, but he didn't. Uh, he's the president. He signed it in the Oval Office, but he had a lot of us there for it. And uh, uh, for the signing, Bob was there, others. So, um, and George H.W. Bush was there. So the first President Bush was there. And someone remarked, you know, this is the first time since the Adams were together that we've had a father-son president together. And there weren't any cameras at that time, but we have a camera now. So we all got to have our picture taken with the two presidents at, at the signing of this, of this, of the ADA Act amendments. But that was basically, that was basically it.
Okay, do we, do you have a question back here? I can't tell. No? Any more questions? Oh, we have two more questions and uh, this and then that will be it. So the let's... The President? <laughs> yeah, we'll get the Chancellor first. <laughs> Chancellor. Senator, thank you for your service and for joining us today. I was uh, interested in the uh, forums that are uh, that you're forming at, at the Harkin Institute, and you had 30 and now 40 foreign countries. It sounds like participating. You know, as as we travel internationally, it's it's clear the world has not followed this lead of accessibility. Right. Uh, even even in well-developed countries, you really don't see the kind of changes that we've undertaken in infrastructure, and certainly in the developing world, not at all. Um, I wondered if you could just speak a little bit about any interactions you've had internationally with these conversations. Have you gotten any traction, and, and what do you see the future for that? Thank you, Chancellor. Well, yes. Um, 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 in the early 2000s, a, a, a group was formed at the United Nations to draft a, a, a proposed treaty, a convention, on the rights of persons with disabilities, called the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, the Irish guy that was head of it, whose name I can't remember right now, excused at my age for not remembering his name, but they, they, they came down and met with a lot of our people about ADA and how that worked and what we did. And so they drafted this convention. And then they put it out for ratification. I think this would have been around 19, uh, 2008. 2008, I think. Let's see, Obama came in in 2009. That's right. So it was around 2008. It was sent to the countries for ratification. Under our system, it goes to the executive branch first. And the executive branch then has to go, under laws enacted by Congress, has to go out to all of the different departments in the, in the executive branch to find out two things. What laws need to be changed in the U.S. if we sign on to it? And what's the budget impact? So Obama's now president. He sends it out, you know, Department of Agriculture, Department of all the different executive branches. And this takes a year or so to come back. And we got a great report back. We don't have, because we're so good, we don't have to change one law, and we have no budget impact if we adopt this treaty. So now we're into 2011, maybe 10, 11. Bob Dole gets really behind this. And he starts organizing offside the hill I'm on the inside with others, to get the Senate, because it's a treaty. So the Senate has to vote. It has to be a, um, a two-thirds vote of the Senate to adopt the treaty. So we're going along. We thought we, have it. we thought we had the votes for it. Certainly Senator Dole thought we had the votes, and we brought it up in December of of what year would that be, 2012? 2012. Yeah, it must be 2012. It was a lame duck session. We thought we had the votes. We lost it by three votes. We got a lot of Republicans on it, but we still lost it because we needed two-thirds. And that was a sad day. And, and, and here's, here's what sticks in my craw to this day. Bob is sort of, he, I, we talked about it on Friday even. So that morning of the vote, we had a big gathering in the Dirksen office building in our committee room. <clears throat> and the committee I was out chairing. And it was a tribute to Bob Dole. So we had Bob there, Elizabeth was there. Huge crowd of disability advocates. People had been working years on this, on this, uh, on disabilities, going clear back to the 80s. All the people had been involved in the ADA, a lot of them were there to pay tribute to Bob and to thank him for all of his great work in the past and on the CRPD, which we're going to vote on that afternoon and which we had the votes for. People came up, talked about Dole, great person he was, all this. That was in the morning, and then we left and went over to the floor of the Senate, and Bob came on the floor of the Senate. He's in his wheelchair. 
Elizabeth is with him. She's a senator too, you know. So we're on the floor and just commiserating with people. And then we broke for lunch. Senator Dole left. Senator, both Senator Doles left. <clears throat> we came back after lunch. That was the first vote after lunch. We lost it by three votes. People who had been at that earlier meeting praising Bob Dole to his face for his leadership on disability issues turned right around and voted against him. It was a sad day. And it was just sad. I mean, we thought we had it. We tried to bring it back again in 2014. 2014, yeah, the last year I was in the Senate. We tried to bring it back. Bob worked his heart out on it. And uh, we couldn't even get it on the Senate floor. Couldn't even get it on the Senate floor because one senator objected to it. <coughs> Want me to name a name? Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. In fact, he was the one that torpedoed it the first time. Torpedoed it the first time. He'd been elected <clears throat> in Texas in 2012. We had this lunch. It was in December. So he hadn't been sworn in yet. I assume we had some on our side that hadn't been sworn in. I can't remember who. Um, but he was recognized, he spoke at the Republican caucus, or the conference, or lunch. And uh, I learned about this later from John McCain, who, by the way, was... St John McCain has never failed us on a vote on disability issues, ever. <coughs> never. Not even remotely. He was a stand-up guy all the time on this. And so when I saw John later, and, it, and the vote went down, he was furious. He said, I'll tell you later. Evidently, Ted Cruz got up at the lunch, introduced himself, he's going to be a new senator from Texas, said, oh, by the way, that UN thing, that UN treaty that's coming up, any, any Republicans vote for that, the Tea Party is going to mark it down as a negative on your, on your scorecard. Scared a lot of people. Scared a lot of people. We lost some people that, sh that basically were for it, and then they weren't for it. And that was a sad day. And Bob was just crestfallen. And then we tried to bring it up two years later. He was working hard on it. He was working with Samantha. Again, this is where you get across. Samantha Powers was our UN ambassador under Obama at the UN. And she and Bob Dole were working together on this all the time. And I was too, but they had formed a nice working relationship to get people on board. But the only way we could, we could get it up was uh, unanimous consent to bring it up on the Senate floor. We only had one senator objecting to it, Ted Cruz. OK. Sir, I'm sorry. I'm out of time. So uh, we have one last formal oh, thing that uh, we have to do, Senator, if you'll stand with me here. Oh, I'm sorry that I. I cut you off. I'm sorry about that. Oh, no. No, no. That's, that's quite all right. He can, you can come up and ask him a question afterwards. That's uh, even better in a way. All right, I get to give you the Dole Leadership Prize for 2017. There are two elements. Okay. There's a cash award of 25000 which wow. you've asked be made to the Harkin Institute. Harkin Institute. So yes. I'll give the check to Joseph. He gets the check. <laughs> all right. But, but you get this fabulous Dole Institute Award. Congratulations. Oh, God. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank, Thank you. Here, I did. Thank you all very, very much. Well, as I'm sure as you can tell by now, I have a soft spot in my heart for Bob Dole. He will always be, to me, just one of the great senators of all time and just one of the great persons, just a, just a wonderful human being uh, that I've been privileged to know and work with. Uh, and disagree with at times <laughs> on things, but uh, a fabulous individual. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's wonderful.
I want to thank you all for coming out today to the program, and uh, I think you've got uh, on the back of your program some upcoming programs that we'll be doing here at the Dole Institute. Hope you can join us for those, and uh, have a great evening. Thanks for coming out. Thank that was you. great. Thanks Thank you again, very much, Bill. Sir. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.